The meeting is now reconvened to open session. The board would like to remind the public the meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We would also like to remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. The board met previously for closed session. Trustee Counter, will you please read the action taken by the board? Yep. At the board's last meeting, the board approved a purchase and sale agreement for property identified as APN 017-174-020-000, commonly known as Lot 49 by unanimous vote. Purchase price was 11500000 11, with an anticipated closing date of January 2, 2023. Uh, that agreement was since executed by the buyer, Waymark Development, LLC. Thank you. Tonight, we have Eddie Hill from Rockland High School. Welcome, we're excited to have you here, Eddie, um, as our student board representative. Uh, will you please introduce the color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Whitney High School Air Force Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and US flag bearer for this evening's color guard is Cadet Captain Heaven Green. The state flag is carried by Cadet Captain Dominic Bora. The right guard is Cadet Colonel Caleb Saliza. The left guard is Cadet Captain Nathan Fulkerson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Color Guard. We'll now move to item 5.1 on our agenda, special recognition and presentation portion. Chief Dosage, will you please introduce our family partners in education tonight? Good evening, President Price, trustees, and Superintendent Stock. The Families Partners in Education program is an opportunity for the Rockland Unified School District to recognize family engagement and involvement to help our students achieve excellence during the school year. For tonight's family partners in education recognition, we have Rockland High School Principal Davis Stewart joining us to introduce the Petty Erickson family. Board President Price, trustees, Superintendent Stock, it's my privilege and honor to recognize the Petty family tonight. Uh, Dave and Lindsay, and can you guys come on up? Yeah, I'm going to go one by one, and really it's uh, for the last almost 28 years, I think, a Petty has serviced Rockland High School, and I'll go through just a little bit of the history here. Uh, the Petty family is an integral part of Rockland High School in many ways. Dave Petty has been one of our longtime benefactors since 1994, 28 years. As a local dentist, he has donated custom-made mouthpieces for a fraction of the cost to our football program since the beginning of RHS. This process includes Dave coming to practice and setting up a workstation and one by one taking impressions to make the mouth guards. Additionally, his generosity with sponsorships has helped provide new equipment for coaches, stipends, facility improvements, and more. Our athletic department has benefited greatly from his generosity and service, and many of our coaches and athletic directors wanted to make sure he was recognized. I sent out an email, and football coaches aren't usually the best at responding. All of them responded back within about five minutes. <laughs> uh, lastly, uh, his service to our entire school community is also appreciated. From float construction over the years, chaperoning dances, and just last year at the end of our year luncheon, I turned around and there was Dave serving food to our staff and picking up afterwards. The unwavering support that Dave and his family gives to RHS is truly second to none. This servant leadership trait has been passed from Dave to all his children, but especially Lindsay Erickson, his daughter who graduated in 2002. Lindsay is a rock star, parent contributor. She, is, she can be seen organizing staff luncheons, planning and facilitating school events like our all school carnival, kickoff this year, sober grad night, community candidate, 
forums, and so much more. There is never a task too great or small that she is not willing to tackle. We don't know where she finds the time between her kids' schedules and all the time she puts in at Breen Elementary as well. On a side note, Lindsay is alumni of 2002 along with daughter Zoe and Ava attending Rockland High School. This family partnership is vital to the success of Rockland High School community and one of the attributes that makes our school a standard of excellence, having parent partners with Rockland High School to help supplement our programs, teams, students, and staff is critical for us to achieve our goals and words cannot express adequately the gratitude that we show the Petty family. We hope that this recognition is a start. I am constantly impressed by their willingness and commitment to serve our school, school community. Thank you so much to the both of you. That was awesome. That was perfect. This one makes me a little bit emotional because these are some of my favorites. Um, and so I am so grateful that Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart shared so many specifics um, because it's true. And the petties do things one way, and that is all in and really well. And so I'm really grateful for all that you do for our community and for our schools and um, your creativity and your talents. It means so much. So thank you. Chief Dosange, will you please introduce our employee recognition tonight? President Price, trustees, and Superintendent Stock, tonight for our employee recognition, we have Granite Oaks Middle School Principal Jay Holmes joining us to introduce Linda Markarian, who is a school counselor that helps to ensure all students have the necessary support to succeed at school every day. Good evening, Superintendent Price, trustees, Superintendent, I mean. President <laughs> Superintendent, Price, Superintendent Stock. President Price, You're good. trustees, Superintendent You're Stock, good. my bad. <laughs> it's been a long day, excuse me. Um, I, when I was tasked to do this award, I, I, I took it on willingly. I, I, I took this as a huge opportunity to honor someone who does so much for the students of Grand Oaks Middle School. Ms. Markarian has worked at Grand Oaks since 2006. She is a person who has been part of everything that we've done at our school. She is someone who takes on the SEL, the social emotional well-being of our students and staff and parents with just such accord. She is a stalwart person. She operates all the programs that honor our students and our families, our, our families who are in need. Um, she helps us with, we call it in the nest, it's no longer PBIS. So if you're at Grand Oaks Middle School, you're in the nest. We're dumping the words PBIS. Our Bully Prevention Month is, is, are, is always a huge success. Um, she is there at a moment's notice uh, because as you all know, middle school students are folks that really need support with their SEL. Linda is there at, at any time to help them out with any need that they may have. Um, whether it be with friends or family or you know old principals, we just we just don't know what the kids might be struggling with. She is a consummate professional. She does not in any way, shape, or form yell and scream when I tell her we have to take things apart one day before school starts and build all sorts of new academies. 
<laughs> that has been happening now for the last, oh gosh, uh, 16 years. Um, we are truly lucky to have Linda Markarian uh, on our campus as a co-lead. Uh, I often spend much time in her office as uh, one of my confidants to help me make decisions for our school. So uh, I'm proud to announce that she is our employee that goes above and beyond, and she truly does each and every day um, as our employee for Grand Oaks Middle School. Thank you so much. Is it on? She really likes recognition. <laughs> she just loves it. Perfect. Well, you I have to say, it. what I noticed the most was that he did not have to read from a script. All of that was straight from his heart. And what an amazing um, testament that is to how important you are on uh, Granite Oaks Middle School campus. Um, it sounds like you not only help all of the students, but also the staff. And you are greatly appreciated. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you so much to both of you and for your families coming. You are welcome to go. You're welcome to stay, but you're also welcome to go. We want to be respectful of your time, and I know those Erickson kids probably have practices to get to, right? <laughs> Thank you, guys. And Jay, happy 26-year anniversary tonight. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for coming. Good. And a 10 years better. Yeah. All right, moving now to our employee organization report. Oh, I guess I gotta wait for Julie. As soon as Julie comes back up, um, Travis will turn the time over to you. Travis, thank you. Trying to give her confidence for later. So, oh, good job. Yeah, yeah. So you can make the microphone crackle like it's my voice and all that kind of stuff. True story. It's true. More like babysitting. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, congratulations on your new title, Superintendent Price. Yeah. So, um, no. Jay's not here to. All right, that's all right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to ask a question to start out. And if you can't answer it right now, that's okay. And it's a question that came up, and then Derek's update from, um, from your closed session reminded me I meant to ask this ahead of time, so I apologize for putting you on the spot if you can't answer it. Um, but you, you mentioned that, uh, that we approved the sale of lot 49. 49? Okay. Which is awesome. I know that's been a, a, like a, took longer than I think we all wanted it to. But the question I keep getting is, do, what are we going to use that money for? Like, I'm sure it's allocated or it's got some boundaries on what that sale can be used for. So everybody's like, I think in the back corner, like going, give it to Craig, give it to Craig, give it to Craig, because we keep hearing about all the facilities and maintenance stuff. So if you can't answer that right now, that's awesome. And, and, I'll, and I, again, I apologize for putting that on the spot. It just popped in my head when you updated. But if you can, I know there's more than me wondering. And Superintendent Stock, do you want to answer that? Actually, I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Superintendent Barbara Patterson to use her microphone and answer sure. that question for Here you. Here I am, throwing everything off. <laughs> Uh, we are working on that. <laughs> We're, no, uh, honestly, um, we have lots of uh, funding pieces, um, reimbursements from the state on, um, on Quarry Trail and on a couple of other projects that we've done, and we are putting together um, an updated capital projects funding plan, and so we'll be bringing that back to the board um, for their review and approval. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I apapologize for putting anybody on the spot. Craig, we're in your corner, though. We got you. Um, I, I do think it's worth noting, though, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's restricted to facilities. Yeah, that's what, so that's I, what I, I figured. I do think it's important yes. for the community to understand that. Yeah. That money's restricted yep. for facilities use only. It can't be used for programs. Perfect. And that's, that's the gist of the answer that I, was, I expected and was hoping to get. So, 
and, and also we, um, you know, so we also, the, the property, we um, still have debt service. So it would also be used in portion to pay, sure. pay what we owe on that yeah. property. I just know we've talked a lot lately about maintenance and facilities and safety and all those things that keep falling into that department. So the assumption I think was that whatever's left or can be used will hopefully flow that way and perfect, awesome, thank you. And thanks for the clarifying point, Rick. I don't wanna lead anybody the, the wrong way. Um, so I, my updates are gonna be pretty brief um, because Tony and Emily are gonna do their show in a little bit. I don't wanna steal too much of their thunder. Um, one big update super excited about is um, as you guys know, and many of you have been involved directly at this point, we've been doing labor work for a long time and starting to reap a lot of the benefits from that and really see it become what I like to think of new culture, not just like a thing that we're doing, but actually kind of who we are and how we do things. Um, and to that note, uh, November 1st and 2nd, we've got um, a new direction that we're trying to take with labor group. Um, so we're gonna be inviting um, principals and site, uh, site rep teams in on those two days to do some teamwork together. We're bringing our third party group back in with us. And Roger and I have had an opportunity to revisit with them a handful of times and kind of build some agendas and really kind of shift that work onto the ground floor of everything. We've been talking about it from what feels like the 30,000 foot view for a few years um, with this dream of like, how are we gonna get this to the masses? And I think we're there, like we're finally there where we're gonna get it at least surface level to the masses. And, and challenge some of those individual groups to who wants to jump on this and kind of take it, you know, head first right out the gate and, and try some things and know that we're gonna, we're gonna fail a little bit and we're gonna learn as we go. And um, Principal Collins loves to use the expression uh, to fail forward. And I think that's a hopefully what we're gonna see with our labor group and our, our rep teams. And um, the, we have a few rep teams we're gonna kind of throw under the bus a little bit and, and nudge them. Um, but we're also hoping to push some of our reluctant groups under, the, under that umbrella as well of like, let's try this, let's give it a, a shot and, and hopefully let the, the leap of faith that we all took with each other and all the stuff we're doing at this level spill down onto our site levels and really translate to what they're doing and in, in most directly into classrooms and all those things that, that we're really here trying to target. So really excited for that, have those reports and, and again, some of you guys get to be there um, and then we'll be reporting out and updating you guys as that goes in our next upcoming meetings. Um, on that same note, it's been fun to take that notion of collaboration and, and get like an awkward pushback from our members recently. I had a member recently reach out to me and was like, why does it seem like we meet about everything? Like we always wanna talk about stuff. We never used to do that. And like, that's like the problem I've been like wishing for is like when people are like, we're too involved and they want too much of our input. Um, and it was just really fun to sit down with that member and, and uh, we're gonna sit down with our site reps again on Monday and kind of revisit that conversation of, we've been begging to be included on decision-making conversations from like the very onset. And now it's happening enough to where people are like complaining about it. Like, and, and it's a good complaint, right? Like we laugh about it, but it's just awesome to know that. And I keep looking to you, Rick, because you really grilled me on this one. I remember sitting in the Home Depot parking lot when you were like, I just need you to have a little faith and. and here's the person I want you to talk to. And I was pretty resistant. Um, and, and here's your I told you so moment, I guess. So you're welcome. Um, but it's, it's been worthwhile. It's been worth the headaches. It's been worth the frustrations. And I can't stress enough how awesome it is when we have people saying we're, we're included in too much. And so now we're just trying to find the balance, right? So we're, we wanna be included, we never were. We're included too much. Now we're working to that middle ground of where we're included where we need to be, but not taking more from people than we need to. And, and not micromanaging every decision um, from top down or, or bottom up. So, um, and then the last thing, um, just kind of that collaboration. And while it was great collaboration, um, I don't, I love the result, but I don't love the result. So we just recently um, signed an MOU um, and it was a, a great opportunity to use collaboration time. Emily has released time with us this year. Uh, myself has released time and then we work with Tony. So we have regular meetings with Tony um, I, they meet weekly, I meet with them about every other week in their rotation. Um, and we work together to, to try to make an attempt at improving the sub situation that we've been dealing with for a long time now. And that's why I say like, I don't love the resolution, but I love that we're attempting to try to make things better. And I don't love it because it's just acknowledging that the problem hasn't gone away. And, and we're just throwing mud at a muddy car and trying to call it clean in the end, you know? So, um, but again, the acknowledgement of, of that it's still a problem that we're working towards some sort of resolution is really the outcome of it. 
and we've all agreed the, the, the expression we keep talking about is like throwing bad money at a bad problem. And, but we're showing the respect and the acknowledgement of something that didn't just go away as this year is as normal and wonderful as it is. We're still dealing with a lot of the baggage of the last handful of years. And, you know, Emily and I were sitting here talking and like, why is it? Why aren't people subbing? What's it? And I don't know what the magic answer is. I don't know if anybody does. One thing that I, I want to acknowledge is that I think people are taking their own personal health more seriously than maybe they did five years ago. Uh, as a teacher, it's not the best when you walk in the room and everybody's coughing, sneezing, and you know whatever, and you see a lot less of that. The byproduct of that, though, is that when people are out, we've got to fill those voids, right? Whether it's students playing catch up, it's teachers play, getting subs, and all the, the ripple effects that come there. So it's kind of a weird dynamic that we're in where people are taking care of themselves, but the byproduct is we don't have enough people to fill those shoes when they're out taking care of themselves. So this is probably me just rambling, maybe more of the thoughts in my head before filtering. But I, again, I just want to acknowledge that without that labor process, without that collaboration, um, this stuff didn't happen in the past. It was just problems came up, we were frustrated, you were frustrated, and we had a solution, you had a solution, and they were usually over here, even though we're trying to say to solve the same problem. But now we don't do that. Now we, we make phone calls, we get phone calls of like, hey, this is a heads up, or hey, let's, let's solve this before it's a problem, whether we can or not. And at least again, the attempt is there. And that's not lost on, on anybody. So it's been a, a really fun process. I, I keep getting, you know, like you guys, you run into people you haven't seen in a little while. Hey, how's your year going? How are things going? And like, I almost don't have an answer. Cause like normally I'm like, okay, well, let me tell you how my year is going, right? And now it's like, my year is awesome. Like, Tomorrow, I'm gonna miss the first of any of my class minutes, and it's only gonna be a little tiny bit, and it's valid and it's justified, and it's a reason I should be missing class, not just another reason I'm missing class like it's been in the past. So I know I've probably told you guys that before that I've been in class, and, and it's been awesome. So just that's how my year is going. I get to be a teacher. I get to deal with the classroom problems, which are what I actually signed up for, and the things that, like as weird as it is, I actually enjoy doing. Um, and the uh, little anecdotal things of just being around kids, right? That's why we all got into this business. Nobody got into this business to work in an office or sit at a desk and make decisions, but instead to actually be with kids and interact. So that's, that's Travis rambling more than he needed to, but that's kind of my update. Like I said, I'm gonna let Emily and Tony do their thing tonight. Really excited. I think just the fact that they're coming up here together is the exclamation point on all this stuff I'm talking about, all that labor work and all the things where we're, where we're looking to go with that. So really excited to, to push that work down to the site levels now with principals and site reps, and, and we'll see where it goes. And hopefully they can come up here and share some of their experiences with us in the near future. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, item 7.1, comments and report from Student Board Representative Eddie Hill. Thank you for coming. We're anxious to hear from you. Um, good evening, trustees and Superintendent Stock. Um, here's some info regarding events and updates from a few of our schools. Um, to start at Cobblestone Elementary, PTC staged a very successful outdoor movie night with over 250 people in attendance and is planning a scarecrow building contest as well as a holiday trunk or treat. The book fair is coming up the first week in November and all are invited to come shop. Teachers are working on planning additional mass support for students to take place in November and December. At Sunset Ranch, Ranch Elementary, they are beginning their Coyote STEM Club, previously called Coyote Math Club, this week. The program is now expanding to include both Sunset Ranch and Quarry Trail. Qualified 10th to 12th graders from Whitney will tutor 3rd and 4th graders at Sunset Ranch on Mondays and at Quarry Trail on Thursdays. At Parker Whitney Elementary School, they are gearing up for their Harvest Festival on October 20th. They are also in the middle of their annual Socktober event, where students collect new socks and toiletries for the homeless in our community. Antelope Creek Elementary held its first monthly CARES Assembly of the Year. Students were recognized for being courteous, achieving goals, being responsible, and for being safe. Antelope Creek intervention and enrichment programs are continuing during the instructional day with additional programs before and after school in the coming weeks. Also, the annual Antelope Creek Fall Carnival took place on October 14th on campus. At Sierra Elementary, they held an assembly earlier this month to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month where Sierra Elementary parents and students taught about some of the 21 Latinx countries and their associated dances, traditions, and how each is unique. 
They're also gearing up for their fall carnival on October 28th. Twin Oaks Elementary School will be having their first dance show since COVID this week. There were performances yesterday and tomorrow evening starting at 10, 6 p.m. The book fair is also open for business this week for students and parents. Timberwolves will participate in the Great Shakeout on Thursday. This will include a practice evacuation drill to safely exit buildings in the event of an emergency. To wrap up the month of October, the first graders will be heading to the pumpkin patch. At Quarry Trail Elementary, the Bronco PTC is planning a special trunk or treat event on Friday, October 28th in the evening. Students and families and community members can come together for some fun and celebration. They started their Math Plus after school program for some third and fourth grade students in partnership with Whitney High School. Uh, Rockland Elementary will be hosting their annual fall carnival and parent night for their book fair this Friday night. At Springview Middle School, they are doing spirit days during Red Ribbon, Red Ribbon Week, October 24th to the 28th. October 25th, the Army will be landing a helicopter on the softball field and students will be able to tour the helicopter. Also that day, the Army is doing an anti-drug presentation to all students. At Whitney High School, Breaking Down the Walls is coming on November 8th to 10th. The Breaking Down the Walls program is a unique opportunity for students and staff to connect, share their stories, and realize it's hard to hate someone whose story you know. On October 14th, Victory High School conducted their quarter one awards ceremony recognizing students for their academic attendance and character achievements. A record 41% of students attained either honor roll or principal's list status. Victory High's AS ASB hosted a breast cancer awareness event where students shared statistics, personal anecdotes, and the Cassandra Woodhouse poem, The Pink Ribbon. The Interact Club is a food drive or the Interact Club is hosting a food drive in anticipation of the holidays. They are collecting non-perishable food items and new or gently used clothing. Now through December, um, thanks to the incredible generosity of our community, they are off to an amazing start. Please donate as there are a lot of families out there in need. Um, at Rockland High School, we just finished our homecoming week over the weekend. Leading up to it, there was float construction days at various float sites for each class. During the week, there was more float construction along with spirit days, homeroom door decorating, and lunchtime activities. The week ended with a great rally, football game with an incredibly prepared pregame and halftime show, and the dance on Saturday night. Like always, our activities program has been focused on connecting students to the campus in a positive way and I am very happy at how these events have done just that. There has been a drastic increase in pride for our school community, and I'm very proud of how everyone was involved. Also, with this being my first meeting alongside all of you for a meeting, I'm extremely thankful for this position and excited to get to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is awesome how many great things we have happening. You did such a great job with all of that <laughs> reading, um, and I appreciate you looking so sharp tonight. Way to dress up, way to look the part. Fantastic, looks good. Thank you so much. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any comments tonight? Eddie, I have to say again, great job. It's uh, phenomenal having you up here. Loved what you read. And I also hear that there are some special guests in the room. I believe you're our grandson of someone quite famous in the room. And so uh, we got to give honor where honor is due. I think it's so sweet to have family here celebrating you. Um, it's a phenomenal accomplishment for a student to say, I want to serve my community and serve my school in this way. And so I just wanted to acknowledge your family and your grandfather, Peter Hill, in the room. So thank you for being here. Um, and again, Eddie, welcome to the team. Excited to work together the, this next year. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And you highlighted something I loved. I actually, I wrote it down how you said it because I thought it was so great about breaking down the walls. We've talked about breaking down the walls multiple times. Um, I loved uh, being able to work with Reef, our education foundation, to really try to expand what we do with breaking down the walls. And I loved how you read it. It's hard to hate someone whose story you know. And I thought, wow, that, that really exemplifies what breaking down the walls is. I know it's been phenomenal for many students, and I'm excited to see this next year that only grow and expand on our campuses. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, I also wanted to highlight our uh, Reef event that we just had, October 13th. What a great event. I just wanted to say a public thank you to Reef, our Education Foundation, 
for putting on that event um, and the many business owners in our community that supported the efforts of that event, the many donations given. Um, you know, I really love that this um, close relationship with, with Reef has allowed them to really support a lot of our board goals and specifically fund math improvement, mental health, choice options, specifically to increase college and career readiness. And so it was great to see those highlighted, um, but it was also just great to see the community come together last week um, and get excited for our schools and supporting our teachers and supporting our students. There was lots of talk about grants for our teachers and lots of talk about scholarships for our students. Um, and I know a few teachers reached out, any that are listening in, that were asking when they get to find out about those grants. It's coming soon. Um, we actually have a subcommittee that is working on the mini grants. I think we had over 30 grants that were submitted and they're uh, funneling through those. And at our next brief board meeting, we will be um, hopefully able to make some decisions and we will be notifying everyone who completed an application. So that'll be coming soon. Again, thanks Eddie, thanks for being here. Thanks for looking sharp. Thanks for uh, all those great updates. Um, it was really great to hear about events across the district, not only, again, sports, carnivals, dances, but just really good to hear that you know, kids are back, things are going on. Um, and it was really, it was amazing to hear a lot of the different schools and at, at all the different levels that kids giving back, kids helping out. Like, that's just a really heartwarming thing to hear that, that from our community and our kids, like, we're, that's a priority. So, so thank you for that, that was amazing. Um, again, Reef was a great event. I, I can't say anything more than what Tiffany already said, but it was very fun, a lot, a lot of great stuff, a lot of great support. Good to hear our partners and our community and everybody working together to make our schools better, which is amazing. And then uh, one last one. Thank you, Marty, for coordinating that. For uh, I, I know we talked about the, the, the helicopter thing coming down. I, I think just, it was really neat. We, we, we got introduced to the guy, we talked with Marty, he, he, he ran with the ball and made this all happen. So um, I wanna go out there and watch, not only see the helicopter land, which is really cool, but just a really great program. The US Army comes out, they work with the, the, the students and the kids, and they just have the whole anti-drug, anti, th that whole conversation about safe living, good, I mean, just doing all the right things. So really neat that they are partnering with us and neat that we can have that opportunity for the kids to see that. So thank you for making that happen. Eddie, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, Travis, thank you for all that you shared. I'm really excited about labor management taking that next step and having it go out in onto the campuses and having more people involved and really taking it down into the classrooms and with the teachers and the principals. I think that's awesome. Emily, I'm so glad you're here and I'm really excited for all that you're doing and all the work that you're putting in to understand the finances and to understand what goes on behind the scenes with all of it. I know that you're working hard, it comes up a lot. We, we hear about all the meetings that you're going through and um, it's a lot of stuff to understand. So thank you so much for putting in that time and being willing to share it with um, the teachers and the exec board and uh, all that you're doing and that goes for Barbara too. Thank you and Tony for what you guys are doing to make this a team and really have everybody's input and understanding for what we're, our intentions are um, with the district. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. All right, that was great. I don't need to repeat my gratitude as well, but um, we will move to the consent. Oh, Superintendent Stock, I don't wanna skip you. Thank you, I, just, I have a quick couple of things. One is, earlier tonight before the board meeting, we had an opportunity to do one of my favorite events is we got to honor milestone years of service of our, of our employees. And we had 108 employees eligible to be honored. And they represented 1,745 years of service that we were honoring. And, and so we had several folks that did 30 years of service and they're still here. Mm -hmm. And so we are just so grateful because we know our district is as outstanding as it is because of the people that serve our kids. And so anytime we can honor, honor our, our colleagues, it's, it's just a great thing to do. So just wanna you know, share if you weren't here getting the cookies and all that earlier, the room was full and it was just great to honor people for their milestones of, of service. And, and 30 year veterans and even you know, Mrs. Patterson was honored for 20 years of service to the district as well. So we, we, we appreciate that. Um, and then we also, just before the next board meeting, it was November 16th, is we will have reached Veterans Day. And we always are so appreciative of all the 
people that have served our country that also serve our school district. Our, our district has numerous veterans in all sorts of positions, and we just thank all of those in our community that have served our country and are continuing to serve our country as well as we approach Veterans Day. And then you heard about Red Ribbon Week. We have, that was, you know, an exhaustive list, but there's even more because we do know that as we have the opioid crisis and the fentanyl issue, that the idea of Red Ribbon Week really takes hold. It's one of those things that we've done forever, it seems, but with this current piece, it's even more urgent. And, and so we, we appreciate all the different partnerships, especially with One Pill Can Kill, to get that message out. Thank you so much. We'll now move to item 8.1. All matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does anyone wish to remove an item from the consent agenda for separate discussion and action? Okay, is there a motion to approve consent agenda items? So moved. First by Julie, is there a second? Second. Second by Derek. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Eddie Hill? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Motion passes. Now to item 9.1, action on AB 1200, bargaining disclosure for Rockland Teachers Professional Association, RTPA, Classified School Employee Association, CSEA, non-represented and confidential employees, Rockland Administrators Association, RAPA, and superintendents. Barbara Patterson, Ch Deputy Superintendent, Business and Operations. Good evening, President Price, board members, and Superintendent Stock. Now the district is required to publicly disclose the cost of collective bargaining agreements uh, prior to the ratification of agreements by the board. Uh, the district and employee groups entered into agreements for the 2022-23 school year in June of 2022, and those agreements included contingency language that if additional revenues, uh, base local control funding formula revenues um, were in this final state adopted budget that we would come back and recalculate um, the total amount for employees. And so um, we met and um, made that calculation. And so this agreement is to add 1.55% to all the salary schedules for all um, employee groups. Um, the true up cost is uh, $1,699,633 in the general fund and uh, $25,000 in com combined in the cafeteria fund, the developer fee fund, and uh, the Mellow Roos fund. Um, the superintendent and I have certified that the district can meet the cost of this agreement, and so the AB 1200 full disclosure document is in your board, uh, board packet for your approval. Thank you. Are there any board comments or questions? Oh. Seeing none, is there a motion to approve AB 1200 Bargaining Disclosure for Rockland Teachers Professional Association Classified School Employee Association, Non-Represented and Confidential Employees Rockland Administrators Association and Superintendents? So moved. First by Rick, is there second. a second? Second by Tiffany. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Eddie Hill? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadhoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Motion passes. Now to item 9.2, action on Rockland Teachers Professional Association, RTPA, true up, tentative agreement and proposed salary schedule and amendments. Dr. Limoges, Associate Superintendent of Human Resources. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, Trustees, Superintendent Stock, Ms. Brenda. If I may, uh, President Price, I'd like to make a request. Due to the um, similar nature of the true up portions that I am presenting to you, I am asking the board if they would be willing to uh, take a singular vote on uh, action item 9293949495 and 96. However, if it pleases uh, the board, I would like to also leave out that uh, if any questions or comments are made either by the board or by the public, they may do so on each individual or each or, or the whole item collectively. Sure. I'll just make a, when I call for the motion, I'll just make it, have it include all of those items. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. And if I may read the settlement. Sure. Um, 
As a result of the governor's May budget revision and the final adopted state budget, there was an increase in LCFF based funding provided to the district. The parties therefore agree to the, the following, and that would be all the, the parties that are mentioned in the items. After allocating a portion of the increase in LCFF based funding as calculated through the fair share formula to cover the cost of the benefit advance added to health and welfare benefits, an increase of 1.55% will be added to the salary schedules for all unit members and those in all respective groups listed on the, the action items. This increase will be made retroactive to July 1st, 2022 to positional pay and will be applied to non-positional pay if applicable to the respective groups, prospectively effective September 26, 2022. Uh, employees will receive the additional retroactive compensation as part of the mid-month payroll cycle. So if there are any questions on either or comments from the public on each individual item, um, be glad to take them. Comments or questions? Okay. Is there a motion to approve items 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, 9.5, and 9.6, which are all ratification compensation true-ups for all employee groups? So moved. First by Tiffany. Second. Second by Julie. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Eddie Hill. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Saddle. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 9.7, action and public hearing on 2023-2024 initial joint contract proposal from the Rockland Unified School District and the Rockland Teachers Professional Association for 2023-2024. Thank you, Madam President. And for this, I'm kind of excited for a new the new way forward, if I could invite uh, the bargaining chair for RTPA, Emily, to come on up. And she is uh, my partner, I would say crime, but that doesn't probably sound right when we're negotiating dollars. I, I know, I know. Um, I'm gonna start a portion and then we're gonna kind of jointly present this to the board. And we're also jointly willing to ask any questions, which is code for you could ask Emily anything you want, but not me. RTPA and RUSD have worked extensively throughout the, the year, and I would say years, to improve efficiency and relationships in the collective bargaining process. As a sign of those changes, we have elected um, and worked with our legal counsel to make sure that this is appropriate to present our Sunshine proposal um, collectively, collaborate, uh, collaboratively. So within the Sunshine um, proposal, we've also talked to the board in closed session, but excited to talk to the public, that we've kind of come to an agreement because we meet on a monthly basis and that we're electing to just kind of leave the entire contract open, giving us the flexibility to work on what needs to be worked on on any point in time. So all the articles are open, but we've created some areas of focus which my colleague will, will share with you as well. And we also have kind of come to the agreement there's always things that happen during the second semester of the year. One of them is our discussion around uh, financials and the governor's May revision where we spend a lot of time there. So if we can open the whole contract, we can work on the majority of the articles we've been continuously working on in addition to any new legislation that has changed throughout the course of the second semester, like TK made a drastic change and we needed to work effectively to be able to implement that. So I'm very excited about that and I'm gonna turn it over to Emily to kind of provide the board and we've never done this before is actually kind of share with you a summary in our areas of focus of what we're uh, trying to tackle this year. Emily, please. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, trustees, good evening, Superintendent Stock and Hi, Barbara. Um, I just wanted to start with a quick kind of walk back 11 months ago when there was there was so much tension and the way that we we settled our 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 contract last year was through through a mediator and you know now Tony and I 11 months later are standing up here presenting to you and Eddie I'm so proud that we get to be here in front of you one of our students uh, you know demonstrating how effective communication can be when we, uh, you know, we stop looking at each other as as maybe adversaries, and and we really turn to our, our commonalities, and and we use that to kind of empower the process, um, and and in thinking that I I want to Rick give you the credit that is due, in that even amidst all that tension 11 months ago, uh, Rick is someone who was willing to come out to Whitney High School and and have a 
some, some uncomfortable conversations with the language arts department, very opinionated. Um, but your willingness to communicate with me, even when you vehemently disagreed with my ideas, is what gave me the confidence to move forward with this, this, this process of collaboration and mutual respect. So I felt like even when we disagreed, you, you demonstrated that you know I was still a human being and I was intelligent and worthy of a conversation. So you know, as part of the celebration, I, I just want to say thank you so much for for giving me the, the trust to move forward with this because I think both sides were taking a big risk. So thank you for that, um, and I think we are all are just looking forward to. We have worked so hard to build a collaborative relationship, and that's based on mutual respect that we're we're continuing to foster and it's not just through talking the talk anymore it's it's coming together and it's spending time together and it's it's walking the walk pardon the cliche but you know actually putting into action all of the things that are so easy to say it's it's so easy to say that i'm going to try and see things from your point of view it's much harder to to take the time and actually do that so i, I look forward to uh, you know, with this board moving forward to continue to, to build that relationship because we've seen it's been so much more productive and to be able to come into this school year and just be teachers has been wonderfully refreshing. And for our new teachers, this is all they've ever known. And I think that that is, that is pretty magical and, and hopefully something that, uh, you know, I know, I know we uh, with Superintendent Stock and, and, and to, uh, and Tony, Dr. Tony, um, yeah, that we're just looking forward to, to continuing that progress, and we are 100% committed to it. Um, and you know, and and I just really feel like we will let we will let nothing get in our way. We are we are going to move forward. So so with that, I would like to present to you um, our our joint interests. And it was really kind of comical when we came together to share our interests with the bargaining team as we meet once a month. That both sides kind of went, you know, yes check, check, check. So, so we're here tonight to share with you that um, while the whole contract is open uh, so that we have the flexibility to deal with concerns as they arise, our, our areas of focus are as follows. So we've got Article 7, which is hours of employment. Uh, Article 8, which is preparation time. Article 9, which is leaves, and that's something that we've been talking about for the last 12 months, so it's really a continuation of a conversation. Um, transfers is, again, a continuation of a conversation. Uh, evaluations, same thing. We, we, we started to tackle it last year, and there were just, it, it was a big list, so, so we'll continue to, to grapple with that. Um, as you know, safety is always at the top of the list, so we have a joint interest in working with our district safety safety committee on, on Article 13 and just doing what we can to make sure our kids feel safe enough to, to learn at, at every opportunity. Um, as always, we'll be talking about Article 16, health, welfare, and retirement benefits, in addition to wages, which is Article 18. Um, and those are, those are those ones that we will be, you know, now that we understand the finances mm -hmm. a little better, it, it doesn't make sense to try and have that conversation in October. We don't have the information, and so uh, we're really hoping to dig into those aforementioned items earlier in the year because we have the information to to work on those, and then that sets aside time for us later in the year when we do have the data to go on to have those financial conversations. Um, and then finally, a joint interest is Article 24, which is special education. Um, in addition, our TPA does have an additional interest of talking about Article 10, which is class size, and that's something we're excited to, to really get into because you know with class size, if we can get those numbers down, it really is benefiting all students. And so we're, we're looking forward to seeing what we can do with that with the understanding that class size is an incredibly complex issue to deal with, and it's also an incredibly expensive issue to deal with. So. Uh, that's something that we're, we're constantly communicating with our members about is, you know, as, as we tackle items that cost money, there is a give and take, not only from business, but also from, from our TPA. So for now, the, that is what we're, we're, we're sunshining to all of you this evening. So thank you so much for your time. Back to you, Tony. 
Thank you, Emily. Um, real quick, like, if I may, I think I would be remiss if I didn't give some thanks. First off, we both have teams of people that have day jobs as well as RTB, and they dedicate their time and efforts and, and knowledge to be at the table. And I also, uh, Superintendent Stock, I know your humbleness really annoys me most of the time, <laughs> but like, I want to give a huge shout out to you. I, and I've shared this many times in many places. I've been in five different districts. I've sat at other tables, but I've never had a superintendent more engaged, more passionate, more willing to take risks and give new things a try to improve things. And I think I also want to, finish, I've had tons of conversations individually with everybody that's on the dais and prior to you and your vested interest um, in getting us to where we are realizing we know we have a lot of work to do and we're gonna slip and fall, but we feel like we have a strong enough foundation to build ourselves back up to, to where we are. And so um, I don't wanna belabor this, but I really want people to acknowledge uh, out in uh, TV land uh, where we've come from to where we are today, which is really inspiring as far as being able to work through the conflict. So um, without further ado, what I'm gonna ask, uh, recommend a motion to have first a hearing and then take action, a motion to take action on the 2023-2024 initial joint contract proposal from the Rockland Unified School District and the Rockland Teachers Professional Association for 2003-2004. Okay, thank you. Before we do that, are there any board questions uh, or comments? Yeah, so I just wanna uh, add my, so I'm, uh, my heart is full. I'm super excited about where we are and what's happening. It was a, a, a lot of work and there is, you know, it's easy to say we're getting along, but there are artifacts you see along the way. Fair share was a huge artifact uh, that we could actually come and do this and that we, the promise of what we want it to be actually came true. This sunshine is a huge artifact. I mean, frankly, I, with my colleagues, th th this is a hard thing for a board to do. Just say, yeah, let's open it all up and let's look. That, that's not, that doesn't come simple. And so I think it's, it, 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 I, I love that there's giving both sides because we see a promise for a, for a much better future and it feels like we are um, really marching in that direction. I will also say, however, that uh, I know Michael Phone always says that, you know, early success is fragile. And, and, and it is, and, and this is great, and this is a moment in time, and we have a lot of work. I can tell by the way you're okay, you've never thought of that before, right? Yeah. We have a lot of work in front of us, and if we're, let's be just honest, the, the chance of our budget looking next year like it did this year is less likely, given where, we go, where the economy is. So we've got some hard work, there's some hard items here in the, that we're gonna have some real disagreements around, and that's good, and that's appropriate. Um, but I think that we have a, a faith and a trust in each other that we're both all trying to do what's best for students and trying to figure out a way to do it together gives me great hope that we're gonna continue to make progress. And so I deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your comment as well. I, um, Julie and I have been part of the labor management team and it's been um, such a great experience to see firsthand um, the magic that comes outside of the comfort zone and um, watching people being willing to do that um, and there's such power in a, um, a joint interest uh, and the things we've done for the good of students. So I'm, I'm happy to see where we're at as well. Yeah, I, I think just that communication, the, the conversations, the, the sitting down, the just having all that. So thank you, thank you both, thank you, and all your teams for taking that time to find the compromise, find the joint interest, sit down and just Here's the things that are gonna work, not gonna work, and, and as Rick was saying, there are gonna be some tough conversations. People are gonna come out frustrated. You, you guys as leaders, you're gonna have to calm people down, you're gonna have to rile things up, you're gonna have to dig in a little harder, you're gonna have to pull you know, layers of the onion back to figure it out, but you know, I thank you guys for, for making it a priority, for, for working together, um, and then as you guys know, like just going forward and looking at it, having that dialogue and, and having those conversations is, is gonna come out the right way, I, I think in the end of all of this, we're gonna say, hey, by having the conversations and sitting down together, we're gonna find the best way to solve this. It may not work perfect for that side or this side or this issue or that issue, but I think it'll come out the right way. So thank you guys, thank, thank everyone for, for doing this. This is very cool. Okay, I now open the public hearing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, now I open the public hearing for the 2023-2024 initial joint contract proposal from the Rockland Unified School District and the Rockland Teacher Professional Association for 2023-2024. Are there any public comments? I now close the public hearing. So fun. <laughs> 
It'd be better if it was my right hand, but my left's pretty good. It's getting better. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve the 2023-2024 initial joint contract proposal from the Rockland Unified School District and the Rockland Teachers Professional Association for 2023-2024? So moved. First by Julie. Second. Second. Second by Rick. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Eddie Hill. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> Action on resolution 22-23-14, approving grant agreements with Placer County Air Con Pollution Control District and authorizing contract with creative bus sales for the purchase of four school buses. Associate Superintendent Patterson. Barbara, will you maybe pull that mic a little bit closer? Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Um, Matt Sanchez, our Director of Transportation, is uh, going to give you a short presentation on this uh, amazing news that we have um, for school bus electrification grant opportunities. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Well, good evening, President Price, Board, Superintendent Stock. It's um, very exciting to be here this evening uh, and share this news with you. And I'm hopeful uh, that uh, the purpose of tonight is to ask you for approval to proceed with some opportunities in front of us. I, I come from also a, a long line of educators and my grandmother used to always say when I had all these bright ideas, what's the purpose? And so that's, she always wanted to get right down to it. So the purpose um, of, this, of, of this project is to really update a very aging diesel fleet. Um, our uh, fleet of diesel uh, buses, we have eight uh, that we're trying to replace that are 27 years old. So if you can imagine, we don't see too many vehicles out on the roadway these days that are 1994, 95 vehicles. Um, we're looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from carriage with diesel. Um, looking to reduce noise pollution, update the latest technology into our school buses, and diversify our fleet for reduced operational cost, and um, at the same time, kind of experiencing a minimal investment for the district. The um, grant opportunities that we have for up, uh, before us are really is offering $2.9 million worth of grant funding. So it's really a wonderful investment. Um, CARB is the main funding source uh, that is uh, providing uh, the funds to be able to be attributed towards our electric buses. And this is really going to help us uh, supplement our bus replacement program, um, it reduce our, our operational costs, reduce our maintenance costs, while really uh, at the same time having some real environmental the first uh, pro uh, grant program I'd like to talk about is really a voucher program through CARB. It's called the School Bus Set-Aside Program. And through this program, uh, they are offering us uh, $1.528 million to go towards four electric school buses. And this specific grant is with zero Rockland contribution. So I'm really, really excited about the School Bus Set-Aside uh, voucher opportunity. The second uh, opportunity I'd like to um, discuss is a combination of funding uh, between uh, Placer County Air Pollution Control District and also HBIP that's funded through CARB. And um, uh, Placer uh, County Air Pollution Control District has been extremely helpful in supporting us towards guiding us towards uh, these grant opportunities all the way even until uh, right now as uh, Ms. Molly Johnson from uh, Placer County Air Pollution Control District is here to observe this evening and um, wanted to recognize her and thank her again uh, for their support. So uh, 
through this grant opportunity, we have a couple different funding sources uh, coming towards us. One is uh, through the Community Air Protection Incentive Program, which is $759,000 of funding, and that is through PCAPCD. And then that's been combined with um, the uh, funding of $420,000 also from HFIP. So when you combine that, uh, we're, we're looking at um, a district contribution of only $242,000 for these four buses. So that, that's a minimal investment of, uh, of funds compared to the, the, the um, $2.9 million of funding that we're gonna be getting. Some information on cost savings, diesel versus electric school buses. Uh, using the PG&E calculator on their website, uh, they have a nice calculator where you enter in the buses that you're replacing, like the age of them, and then you put how many buses you're replacing, what the fuel costs currently are that we're um, um, paying, and it will calculate your cost savings. So the numbers that they've provided us are 72 cents per mile or $106,000 annually uh, for these eight buses, which is basically 13,250 per bus. There is also significant maintenance uh, uh, savings because the electric buses just really don't have your typical vehicle components. The engine that's not there, transmission not there. Um, we're evolving to newer braking systems that are just you don't see in the buses typically. So we're getting disc brakes instead of drum brakes. Uh, those reduce costs are significant. And the safety level of the disc brakes far exceeds the drum brakes that are typically on school buses. You see escape routes on freeways for truckers and that's for when the, heats, mm -hmm. the brakes heat up, they have to find a way to stop the bus. Disc brakes, they stay very cool, they don't heat up. They're not 140 pounds per drum. I mean, they're just, um, there's a lot of benefit for the maintenance savings. So you, what you see here is typical maintenance cost that we have um, for a bus in a year for diesel, uh, which is uh, about 37.50 per bus annually, which equates to about $30,000 annually of maintenance savings going to electric instead of diesel. The electric versus diesel bus lifespan, diesel has always been looked at as a lifespan of 15 to 20 years. Uh, we repower buses at about $23,000 per engine. Um, the electric bus lifespan, uh, the batteries are basically, they're saying eight to 10 years, and the replacement costs are between 25 and 35,000. Um, the batteries are uh, repurposed basically after they're done solar or reusable energy pro uh, projects. So the, the, when, when we kind of looked at the cost savings from the fuel compared to the electrical rates, uh, the maintenance costs, uh, it really over the 16 year period equated it to $1.8 million. It would be more expensive to run diesel than running these eight electric buses. So the, some of the, the, the deficits they typically say of these electric buses are initial costs. <laughs> so that's, that's where uh, this is so exciting, you know, and then the other is, is range, and the range for these buses are just ideal for the community of Rockland. So if that isn't good enough news, um, <laughs> we, we have more good news we think that is coming and uh, we have a grant in with EPA, and we're, you know, we may be awarded up to eight buses. Um, we are um, always looking at other opportunities that may come up in the future. Um, there's also um, the school bus set-aside grant that we uh, hopefully will be approving tonight that covers 100% of the cost of of the four buses, that grant is also um, giving us an opportunity to um, have additional infrastructure um, 
savings, another grant. So I think I may have skipped over that bullet point regarding the infrastructure. So I have to back up a little bit and say, well, I guess I have a little bit more good news. Uh, the the uh, Placer County Air District is also offering $201,000 uh, funding to go for infrastructure for these eight buses. In addition to that infrastructure funding, HVIP set aside grant is also offering infrastructure funding. So we will bring that information back to you in November um, when we get the fine details from PG&E and the, the cost that it's really going to come down to once they do their site walk and then uh, kind of look at some of the LCFF credits if that's a potential and go over those additional costs versus additional benefits that we may be receiving. So um, that's kind of in a nutshell the good news and I'm very excited uh, as well as the, I know we all are and hopefully um, we get to proceed with this opportunity. Are there any questions? I just have one comment. Um, thank you for your work. I know it's a lot of work to get a grant, and we're big grant fans. So thank you for oh, you're your welcome. efforts. You're welcome. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have, um, our total bus fleet is how many, approximately? We have uh, 31 school buses. Okay. So this pulls eight, another a total of 16? Or is it just eight for now and then eight, eight for now? Future? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like a, a slow transition to, to kind of slowly get to that to, to see see how those eight do okay. we've got a majority of fleet that'll just be 25 percent of our fleet that are electric um, a lot of districts are kind of looking at some type of a 50 50 blend until we really prove that roseville i talked to them uh, again today they're kind of on board to do the exact same thing looking at trying to do a 50 50 diesel uh, electric split and, it's and you were talking infrastructure this the funding also helps, I guess, chargers, converters, inverters, that part, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the infrastructure and the chargers will go uh, with that. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, that, that's all included in the funding. So, so perfect. And then, um, I guess, where we're getting the buses from, is it local guy, state guy, U.S. guy? Uh, yeah. Most of the school bus manufacturers, Bluebird, Thomas, and International, their main production area units are out of state. We work with their with their sales reps that are here in Sacramento. Excellent, excellent. Okay, welcome, so welcome. We're, we're looking at creative bus sales um, and then international school buses. Okay, and then and then one last one, and I know you spoke a little bit about um, not typical components um, as far as our mechanics and our maintenance guys will go through the training so that this is all new to them too, right? So we want right. to make sure they're covered. <laughs> right. Uh, Joey and Greg and I, both went to a training session about two weeks ago where they put an electric bus exactly like the one we're going to be getting that I had actually received grant funds when I was in Elk Grove and that was the actual bus and so uh, we kind of walked through underneath that bus with our mechanics and they just went through the different components what was there what was not there what we can anticipate and they're going to provide ongoing training uh, for our mechanics to make sure that they understand awesome. the preventive maintenance inspections, what's different about it, what things are different. You know, they have all the wiring labeled, whether it's orange for, you know, the most severe, be careful. And they, they just, and th then they also have a really good educational format so that we can connect with our fire department, go over, you know, the bus, the specs, and so they can understand if anything was to happen out on the roadway that they understand the bus as well. Cool. Okay, and, and then as Rochelle said, like, thank you. We, we love the grants. This is an amazing thing. Just cool to see this all come together and, and if, looking forward to seeing those new buses out there in the future. So. Me too. I was very excited about it. I was thinking we might get two or three, and then when it looked like eight, I just got very excited when we see eight 1995 school buses um, in the yard. We don't want, you know, the, the, the political, what do we call it? CO2, carbon, getting out into the community, and you know we, we've got idling laws around schools that we don't idle, but at the same time, we just want to get those buses off the road. So uh, thank you for your time. Any as far questions? as from like a student perspective, I think the idea of the safety portion 
really stood out to me. And I feel like if it's not happening now, it's going to happen in the future with electric. And um, with this grant, it's, I think now is a good time to do it. So. Yeah, there's a lot of extra safety benefits other than the braking system, yeah. you know, like the left shoulder belts that are now you know, standard in all buses. Um, the 360 view, you know how when you put a yield on car in reverse and you see the behind you, these buses have a camera system that gives you a 360 view completely around the bus to see all students around it. There's just so many more technolo technological advances that they've got that we would also benefit from. Um, it, it's super exciting to get it here and then get our kids on it. I had a question regarding range. Um, yes. I know that was mentioned a little bit. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to really, it sounds like pilot eight buses and really see how, how does this work for our community. I know some rural districts had shared with me concerns about range and um, it sounds like we've kind of looked at our demographics. Could you speak a little bit about this um, idea of a combined fleet for parents that might be concerned if we have lengthy trips? If we have, do you expect us to really continue to keep that combined fleet? I, I know I heard a 50-50 model. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. It's, it was, it, it's a big concern as far as the range uh, in general in California, not so much here in Rockland. Um, but um, certain school districts, school districts that are large, like Elk Grove, 320 square miles to surface, I mean, that range has to be large. Uh, for our community, with our routes averaging about 70 miles a day, the range on these uh, batteries, uh, the battery life is like 130 to 150, and they have the ability to be charged between 9 a.m. And, and 1 p.m. when you're not using them, as well as 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, the, the range is just not an issue for the buses we're getting and the purpose for which we're going to be using. Where our concern would be is when we start doing larger buses and we're looking at Fresno or we're going to San Francisco and we're, we start having range considerations, which is exactly why we've had discussions with wanting to have a diversified fleet to make sure that we have the, the diesel buses to be able to um, go to, for, you know, fulfill the long range. Perfect, and that's what I assumed, but just wanted yeah. to make sure to ask. Um, and I appreciate, um, I, I had several questions regarding lifespan and, and the need. I, are we at a place where we need to, to replace some of our fleet? And it sounds like we do. And so if we're, if we're at that place, then this is a, a wise option for us fiscally um, and taking into consideration safety as well. That was enticing to me. Um, so I do thank you for this presentation because I had several questions and it actually answered six of them that I've checked off. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for that. Nice. And thank you for taking the time to clarify a little bit about range and making sure our, our fleet stays diversified for those long range trips. Thank you. You're welcome. Matt, I just want to say thank you. This is huge. What we're yeah. getting for the small amount of money that we're investing as a district is massive. I thought, you know, we should have some party streamers or confetti or something. <laughs> Seriously, thank you. This is awesome for our district. We're really getting out ahead of um, what's going to need to happen in the future. And to get these eight buses now for such a small investment is incredible. Thank you for your hard work. Is there a motion to approve resolution 222314, approving grant agreements with Placer County Air Pollution Control District and authorizing contract with Creative Bus Sales for the purchase of four school buses? So moved. First by Julie. Second. Second by Derek. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Eddie Hill. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Motion, motion passes. Thank you. Item 9.9, .9, item action on resolution 22-23-15, authorizing participation in the HVIP public school bus set aside for small and medium air districts and contract with creative bus sales for the purchase of four school buses. Again, Associate Superintendent Patterson. That presentation was for both um, First four buses and then the second four buses. So um, there's just two resolutions. Okay, so I can just call for a motion on that one as well. Okay, 
Is there a motion to approve resolution 22-23-15 authorizing participation in the HVIP public school bus set aside for small and medium air districts and contract with creative bus sales for the purchase of four school buses? So moved. First by Derek. Second. Second by Rick. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Eddie Hill. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 9.10, discussion and action to nominate Placer County Committee Representative Superintendent Stock. Uh, trustees, uh, the, uh, the school, uh, the board this evening has the opportunity, though it is not required to make a nomination to serve on the Placer County Committee. Uh, this committee um, is, has representatives by supervisory district throughout Placer County, and it uh, works to serve, uh, to approve any new districts, territory transfers, district mergers, and or uh, the uh, different things associated with boundaries uh, within school districts and even Sierra College. Uh, the county committee term is uh, services for four years. Uh, currently, uh, Todd Lowell is serving that capacity, and uh, he has uh, uh, said that he is, uh, appreciates the, the opportunity to serve, but that he would like to provide that opportunity to somebody else in Supervisory District 3. And so we thank him for his service. So this item is placed before the board to see if they would like to uh, consider nominating somebody uh, for that. And then any nominations will go to the county committee, which Trustee Hupp serves on as our representative, who then would vote on people to be on the district county committee. So if you're confused, um, so are most people regarding <laughs> all these different names. So, so Julie would not be you know, theoretically eligible because she would be voting on who serves on that. The only restrictions are uh, nobody that is employed by Placer County uh, schools or a school district in Placer County cannot serve on that uh, committee. And they must live in Supervisory District 3 and um, must be of so legal yeah, voting age. Yeah, I just, I was, yeah, I was, the, the question the Supervisory District 3, is this the current Supervisory District 3 or the future all-inclusive Rockland District 3? My understanding is it's the future uh, District okay. 3. So I got to, someone's got to live in Rockland slash a little bit of Loomis. Cor correct. And and all of yeah, like that, it's all of Rockland and a little bit of Loomis. No, no, that's the okay. So yeah, so so the current. Let's see here. I'm gonna do this off of memory, so I apologize. The current District Two is all of Lincoln and a little section of Whitney Ranch. Three is that, but I think what what Roger's saying is this is about the future. District 3, so that'll be all of Rockland and a little bit of uh, Loomis is that future District 3. Correct. Okay. Are there any board comments or questions? I'm just curious if we, uh, can we nominate someone who's not here and then they'll find out we nominate them and they can choose to accept or not accept? <laughs> Yes, if the board uh, were to nominate them, then my office on behalf of the board would contact them, let them know they have been, an, uh, and then they would have that opportunity. So the board also could have the option to nominate more than one and, and you know, give an order of preference. If this person would like to serve, if not, then this person would serve. So I, I, guess, so I have a nomination. I nominate Tiffany Sadoff <laughs> for the position. I will second that. I actually really like the idea of it being a trustee because um, if we have some issues that we need to be well represented by us, then we have um, a voice. And yeah, yeah. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to nominate? Okay, uh, Brenda, do I just call for the motion now? Is there a motion to nominate Placer County Committee Representative Tiffany Sadoff? So moved. First by Derek. Yeah. <laughs> so oh moved. Boy. First by Derek, second by Julie. Brenda, will you please call the roll? <laughs> Eddie Hill. No, just kidding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Rick Miller? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Abstain? Don't I? Have? Rochelle Price? Yes. Motion passes. You would abstain. 
we will, uh, of tr trustees, we will forward this nomination paper to the county. Thank you. Now to information item 10.1, 2022 district safety update, Marty Flowers, Associate Superintendent, Secondary Education and Educational Services. Uh, before I get started, besides being a comedian, I, I wanted to mention <laughs> that Eddie is a very solid water polo player at Rockland High School, and I, I don't want to put the cart in front of the horse, but at the next meeting, maybe we could see how their season ends up. Uh, they're doing very well, but there's still a couple games left, and then obviously playoffs. But uh, uh, I know we had to leave our uh, meeting early because they were playing Granite Bay. Do you have any idea what happened with that game? Uh, <laughs> Eddie, can you recall? We won yeah. by four goals, <laughs> and I scored six. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Very good. So, uh, President Price, Trustee, Superintendent Stock, I'm honored to come before you tonight to give you the 2022 district safety update. Uh, just a quick overview. We'll talk about the history of the di district safety committee, the uh, purpose of that, the current members, just an update of what uh, took place in the fall, our current resources on safety, uh, our recommendations made by multiple uh, groups, and then uh, uh, those specific recommendations as far as the one-time funding, and then next uh, steps. With that, just a little history on the District Safety Committee. Prior to 2017-18, we had a committee here, but it was mainly just a few of us here at the district office. At the request of Superintendent Stock, we made that into a district-wide committee that is now made up of uh, site administrators, teachers, lead custodians, RTPA, CSEA representatives, Rockland Police and Fire uh, parents, and then other community members. Currently, we have 34 members that serve. Uh, originally, we met twice a year, uh, but because of things that have taken place over the years, and we did not meet twice a year during the COVID years. We had a couple of Zoom meetings, uh, but we are now planning on meeting four times. The first meeting this year actually took place prior to the school starting on August 2nd. The second took place October 4th, and the uh, future meetings are set for January and May. I have the honor of serving on this with my, my partner, uh, Mr. Craig Rouse, and I appreciate him, and also give a shout out to Ryan Johnson, who serves as well. So um, with that, in, in the words of Matt Sanchez's grandmother, you know, get to the purpose. Um, really, the purpose of this is, is for people to come in and collect information from the site council, from teachers, from parents, other community members, and make sure we're aware of that. You know, sometimes I hear things like, well, this doesn't work and that doesn't work. But if Craig and his crew is not aware of it, it's hard for them to fix that. So we always say that safety is our number one priority. We want everyone to feel safe on our campus. And if something's wrong, we really want to make sure we, uh, we fix that as soon as possible. So that's really the purpose of this. Also, that take this information during these meetings and communicate back out uh, to other families, community members, and then obviously people at the school sites. And then finally, it's, it's for the committee to make recommendations that I could bring forward either in cabinet or in a board meeting to, to ensure that we're doing everything we can to make sure our district's um, safe. With that, just our current members, you see a large group of district office. We have site administrators representing elementary, middle, and high. We have everyone, including our, our police chief, uh, Chief uh, Banks, serving on that. Rockland uh, Fire also serves. Majority of the community is made up of teachers. Uh, you see equal representation there between um, elementary, middle, and high school. And then finally, our, our parents. I just want to give a shout out to Paul Wibera. He's the safety officer out of William Jessup. He's been on there since the beginning, and he's instrumental in bringing all those updates he does every single day to keep William Jessup safe. He brings that to our community as well, so just a shout out to them. As far as what we did fall, uh, at the beginning of this year, I think I've mentioned this before, but Rockland Police Department uh, held two active shooter trainings at Granite Oaks on July 11th and August 4th. Uh, RTPA was invited, as well as other administrators, just to see what actually takes place. Uh, I, I, I attended the one on J uh, July 11th, and it, it is interesting. Again, one of those things that we hope we never have to use. However, I'm just uh, proud to say that Rockland PD is, is, is trained and ready to go if uh, that's ever needed. Uh, with that, I also want to update um, our, give an update on our updated run, hide, fight, and I want to give a shout out to Principal Carrie Alway. Uh, she and her husband, who works for the Office of Emergency Services, are very into this, and, and she dedicates a tremendous amount of time and brings us information, and she works closely with myself and Craig, also works closely with Rockland PD to make sure we have all the updated information to, again, 
keep our schools uh, safe. We took this updated information and presented that in our district kickoff on July uh, 28th. Uh, Rockland PD was there and presented as well. We presented to all district leaders who then took that information and then shared that back at their sites. Um, and that included uh, all leaders, including Mr. Sanchez. I was able to attend his kickoff and he talked about safety uh, even while driving a bus. Um, at our first district safety committee uh, meeting, and, and a shout out goes to Travis who's not here, but uh, unfortunately that meeting took place before school started and right after the events that took place in, in Texas. Terrible tragedy there. Uh, we talked about that and at the end of the day, the safety committee made a decision and with Travis's support, we sent out a joint communication that our, our expectation is that all classrooms are locked during instructional hours. It doesn't mean that teachers can't go out and do small group or have outdoor instruction. However, as we know, a majority of the time when kids are in class, uh, that door, there's no reason why that door can't be locked. Uh, uh, and what I appreciate about Travis sending out that joint communication, sometimes when the, the district office sends that out, sometimes people might not pay as, as close attention, but with Travis supporting that as well, uh, that's one thing that doesn't cost anything that we could do to do everything we can to ensure the safety of all students and staff while on campus. So again, I appreciate his support there. Uh, in addition to this, all departments, and by all, I mean all, schools, maintenance, transportation, here at the district office, as well as nutrition services, they start, have started and continued to do their yearly safety training drills. And then finally, um, I was proud to say, I, I was able to go to a uh, school safety symposium held at Jesuit High School by the FBI and the Sacramento uh, Sheriff's Department, and they really focused on run, hide, fight. Uh, what made me proud is through Carrie, her husband, and all the work we've done, we've already instituted that, and that's what we've been training on the past couple years, where other schools are just starting some of that training. So again, run, hide, fight, I know sounds a little scary. Uh, however, it's very direct and it's easy to understand. There's other programs out there, but sometimes you get a program and what does that acronym stand for and stuff? What we're gonna teach is run, most of the time we're gonna hide, and then heaven forbid if we ever have to, we're gonna prepare our kids to fight. So that's just a quick update there. Uh, other people have asked, well, what do we do on safety? And this is just our current resources we spend on safety, approximately between 800 and 1.2 million dollars. And this is not an exclusive list, this is just areas that we do spend money on. We really focus on that physical, emotional, and cyber safety, which is, is becoming more and more important. Uh, our school resource officers, again, they were here tonight to support us, and they're out there every single day, and, and I'm proud of the relationship we have with them. Our mental health and social emotional supports that we all know students and staff need. Uh, site repairs, and we'll talk more about this, and, and, and Craig is here to talk about that. Our door locks and our alarm systems, our catapult response system, crossing guards, discipline techs, and then Ryan Johnson with his work with the online and cyber safety. Th that's just a, an example of what we spend that 800 to 1.2 million dollars on. Um, with this, we did go out to a multiple of groups, our district safety team, uh, our, excuse me, committee, our district leadership team, and then we also met with members of the uh, Travis and the Rockland Teachers Professional Association. The themes that came out of that was uh, the first bullet there, to make sure that, that uh, the safety items we do have right now actually work. And, and again, a shout out to Craig and his crew. Earlier today, our, our locksmith, Joe Peretta, celebrating his 30 years of service. Uh, he's a busy man, and frequently he's out there first thing in the morning when we get something, a late night football coach, the lock doesn't work. Uh, Joe's out there at 6 a.m. making sure, because again, we need to make sure our, our facilities lock. Also a theme to sustain and enhance current safety measures. They like the fact that we have school resources uh, on there. They like the fact that we have that good relationship with our local police department. And then finally, we continuously update our school safety plans. Uh, tomorrow I'll be attending uh, a drill at Rockland High School, evacuation drill. And again, monthly at all of our schools, we're doing drills so students understand and they know how to react and where to go in case of an emergency. Finally, those recommendations as in regards to the one-time funding, uh, I'm not gonna go over all the dollars. You can see uh, we're hoping for a total of $730,000 in the area of safety. Door locks to replace and repair. Uh, at the time Whitney High School was built in Rucola, we, we got the, the most modern lock. Okay, if you think about that, that's going back 15, 16 years. Now with the locks, now with some of the shipping issues, 
things like that. We're running some troubles with that, and, and Craig can answer some additional questions if you have them, but we want to make sure all those are up and working correctly. Uh, unanimously across the board, our site administrators want walkie-talkies. Uh, so we're working on that to standardize that. You know, walkie-talkies, not only do the administrators have that, but we have our new supervisors, some of our special ed classes that need that to where a walkie-talkie, you know, you're going to put something out there and, and a number of people will hear that and come, uh, come running. Uh, classroom window coverings. This kind of sounds like a funny one, but understand some of our schools are old, whether it's from kids horsing around or what, but, but the hide portion of our run, hide, fight truly means that, that you're going to hide you're going to shut those blinds. You're going to barricade that door. And we have some of our classrooms that, like I said, through uh, just being old, damaged, what we want to ensure that they can hide in those classrooms. Um, uh, an additional resource officer. And you can see here, post-granting, grant funding. You understand that right now we, we pay for two uh, resource officers. They're located at both of our high schools. We have a third, but that's all paid for out of grant funding. They've applied for that. They will get information at the end of the month. However, one of the questions on the application was, how many times have re you received this funding? We've got it the last couple times we have applied. So we just want to make sure we sustain and have that. So the recommendation is that, that we include that third middle school uh, in case we don't get that. If we do get it, that's icing on the cake. But we like the fact that we have one at the middle school and two at the comprehensive sites. Uh, we also are recommending a school safety assessment and additional training. Years ago, uh, we did this with a third party. They came in and assessed some of our schools. Uh, and, and when we did that, we got, a, we got the whole spectrum as far as do a little bit or as far as the maximize, have bulletproof glass around the op and all that. We want to get one in that, that this is what they do for a living and really take a look at our facilities. Are they safe? Where can we improve? And take a look at that. And also look at our training. And, and are we doing enough? Is there additional training that's necessary? Um, the alarm and phone system, uh, Ryan Johnson and his team is replacing this. We're doing some additional training uh, with some of that newer technology we have. And then finally, some additional cameras. As you know, a couple years ago, all of our sites have cameras. We've noticed that there are some areas, or I should say students have noticed, there are some areas that don't have cameras, but we just are looking to enhance that uh, to continue to provide a safe environment. So again, the total there, $730,000. As far as next steps, we will continue to meet. And if you ever want to join us in January, um, or the last one of the year, you're welcome to uh, join that district safety committee. We will continue to update and attend safety trainings and other conferences. Uh, our sites will continue to do their mon monthly drills. Uh, again, every time I ask the sites to invite our police department, to invite our, our fire department, and frequently they do go out to observe. And then after every drill, there's a debrief what worked, what didn't work, because again, we, we need to practice this and to ensure that all of our staff and of our, all of our students know how to react in case of an emergency. Uh, finally, if approved tonight, uh, we will begin working to implement any of the safety recommend, uh, recommendations mentioned earlier. And that concludes my presentation, and Craig and I, and even Ryan may be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. I just want to clarify, we're not actually approving something tonight, right? No, we'll be bringing an information item uh, around one-time funding and ask for approval on November 16th. Okay, no problem. I just wanted to be sure. Wishful thinking. Uh, wishful thinking. Um, tell me a little bit about how we educate students on run, hide, and fight on an annual basis. So every year they go through that. Uh, once again, and, and I'm, I'm going to highlight some of the work elementary principals have done. Because of, of California Ed Code, there are certain drills that have to take place at elementary, middle, and high school. They work together, so we have a template of all those drills. Uh, Carrie and her, her team have put together. We, we train differently. When you hear run, hide, fight, and you're talking about a second grade class, we're probably not going to talk a lot about fighting. Mm -hmm. We're talking about if something does go down, this is what we want you to do, how we want you re to react, and, and they really practice on that hide. Uh, they do it in such a way not to scare the kids. Uh, information goes out to the parents prior. There's, there's a form email that we ask principals to share and then share all the information with parents so they too can talk to their kids a, about this. Uh, interesting enough, just uh, last week at the superintendent's advisory committee, we did an update on safety and we had a lot of those questions um, in regards to how do we 
do this. And, and the response from the parents uh, was very positive once they saw that we do train differently in, in making sure that they're aware that this is taking place, that they have those conversations. And just at my own table, uh, one of the parents said that, so, so just as we have emergency plans in the home, I need to tell my kids an emergency plan in case something goes down at school. And, and I, uh, this kind of goes against the, the drills because we want kids to fall in place. But if you really stop and think about it, in a true emergency, and I'll use myself as a bad example, but because I live very close to Springview Middle School, both my kids understood that if something actually were to go down, you're directed to run home, and I will get you. I will find you. Uh, it might take three or four hours to do that, but they had a place they knew where to go in case of a true emergency. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that it's age appropriate. I'm thinking more on the high school campuses when you think about you know, where Mr. Carlson's Spanish classroom is on this end, where Mr. Spies's class is, is class is on the other end. Do those kids know? Are you guys given some specific direction of where where would the running be towards? Sure. I, I don't need you to answer it, but no, I would love to hear it, Eddie's answer. Do you feel like that specifically is given? When we do the um, run, hide, fight training, mm -hmm. it's all based on location. And the nice thing about it is they do it in every single class that you could possibly have. Perfect. So it's not just one presentation and you're like, okay, I know what I'm going to do in this classroom. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do for the other seven or the other five or whatever? Um, it's actually presented in every single classroom so the teacher, the students can ask questions. And it's basically each classroom is different, like you're saying. Yeah. If you're in the Spanish classrooms at all the way on this side of the campus, you're in a different situation. And I feel like, at least speaking from the student perspective, it is it has been a very big program mm -hmm. and there's no student who hasn't experienced or known like what am i going to do in this situation so i feel like it's it's been going very well great thank you for your perspective i appreciate that i'm i'm with you i think that there's some power behind um this program and it's a different way of thinking about it than we do as a kid but it's also really clear it's like stop drop and roll you can figure out run hide fight right so i like it too thank you anybody else have any you know, Eddie, thank you for sharing that. It, it was great to hear from a student's perspective. H how is this actually playing out? Is it working? Do you understand? So thank you. That's helpful. Um, I, I wanted to just reiterate my support as a trustee for a couple of these items on slide nine. Slide nine was really beneficial to me because I know as I'm out talking to parents, a lot of them are, are saying, this is great. I, we feel like our, our children are safe, but what are we actually doing and what are we planning to do that's new? Um, and so I really appreciate this because now I can copy and paste and share this with everybody. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to reiterate um, a couple things on there. Uh, the additional cameras, I, I, I want to do whatever I can as a trustee to support that. I think that's incredibly beneficial. Additionally, um, the school resource officer at each middle school. I'd love to see, I think right now you were saying it's contingent on a grant. Is that correct? Correct? Correct. Currently, uh, Officer Newton uh, serves both middle schools. He's paid for out of a grant. Okay. Uh, they have reapplied for that. They should know by the end of the month whether or not they will receive that grant funding. So I'd love to see, I know um, this is just to kind of get our ideas, right? Sure. Wish list. I think on my wish list, I'd love to see as a trustee um, looking at the feasibility of being able to um, have a resource officer on each of our middle schools and high schools so they're not sharing. I don't know if that's feasible, but that would be a desire of mine as a trustee if we could make that happen. Um, and then additionally, I, I just was wondering, the, the committee that meets, um, is there ever a possibility for the committee or does maybe RPT, RPD do it for us, physical walks on our campuses? I know I've had some parents ask, do we have concrete pylons on every single campus, right? And I'm driving around to check. Is that something that the safety committee has done or plans to do specifically um, these concrete pylons to prevent vehicles from driving up on campus, ensuring that those are in at every single campus. Have we looked at that before? Uh, that has not been brought up. I, I will say just thinking, uh, I know at Rockland High School, we don't have the concrete ones. We have the metal ones that are there. Uh, as you walk into the stadium at Whitney High School, you have the metal ones there as well that are removable. Um, 
Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure, but I'm sure And definitely, I, I apologize. I don't mean for you to answer for every no, no, campus. No. I just wondered if we haven't done that yet, I would love for our safety committee to have the opportunity, and whether it's a subcommittee, um, but to physically walk each campus and see do we feel we have everything we need and come back to trustees and say, hey, we need concrete pylons or whatever the specific need is. And, and we do. We walk the campuses daily. And our, our night uh, custodians, before they leave the site, they make sure that the fire line gates fire lane gates are locked, that the ballards are put back in, and we do have the ballards in front where cars can come into the high school campuses, and we have the ballard in front so we can keep the, the, the vehicles from coming onto the campus. Do you know off the top of your head if we have those on our elementary campuses too? We do in certain areas, right, okay. where, where the, um, not all entrances, mm -hmm. but it, where there, there's no curb, we, we should have mm -hmm. ballards, or ballards. Okay. And then the Which fire lane gates are locked up. It would be beneficial, I think, to check with our RPD to see do we do we feel we're sufficient the way we are, or is there any need there? But thank you very much. And, and one of the reasons, too, uh, Trustee Setoff, that we uh, put in there is to have some additional school safety assessments done by the outside company that Mr. Flowers mentioned, was to have an outside look on what are some items that we could do to strengthen, what are some recommendations, and so that we could look at a, a comprehensive approach and also a prioritization approach. And so that's why you know, to share that interest, we put that in there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marty, appreciate it. Now to information item 10.2, RUSD one-time spending plan, Barbara Patterson. Dr. McDonald and I will present the proposed plan for two one-time funding grants that the district will be receiving this year um, through the 2022-23 state adopted budget. Uh, we'll all review um, funding sources, allowable expenditures, the stakeholder input that we uh, gathered, um, the rationale for our three-year uh, plan, and a priority uh, for use of the one-time plan. Then we'll present the details of the uh, three-year spending plan and uh, next steps. So the two grants are the Arts, Music, and Instruction Materials Discretionary Block Grant. Um, the estimated amount is uh, a little over $7.1 million, $7 million. And the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant, which is uh, a little over $5.1 million. Uh, we are propo they're proposing to pay us in two equal installments for each one of these grants in November and December, and uh, again in the spring. So the Arts, Music, and Instructional Materials Discretionary Block Grant, we can spend these funds all the way through June 30th of 2026. Um, they're restricted funds, and so they have to be spent on certain uh, in certain areas, and so we have to spend them on um, to obtain standards aligned to professional development and instruction materials, uh, improve school climate, um, training on de-escalation, restorative justice, digital literacy, physical education, learning through play, and this uh, grant also allows spending on operational costs. So the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant um, can be spent through June 30th, 2028. Uh, the spending requirements for this uh, fun these funds are more restrictive and must be focused on learning recovery by establishing initiative initiatives to support academic recovery and staff and student social and emotional well-being, increased instructional time and or accelerating progress to close learning gaps through implementation of learning supports such as those listed here at the bottom of the screen. So a three-year plan allows for a deep implementation and coherence of the initiatives. It will allow for changes in the work if needed based on data and changing needs. It limits the impact that spending in a single year would have, thereby allowing thoughtful and focused spending decisions within staff capacity. And if the results of the spending to really deeply implement 
these systems and supports over time are successful, then it, it will allow uh, us time to build the spending and ongoing budget to sustain these systems and supports. The priorities for these funds in this proposed plan are to enhance current school safety efforts, address board priority goals such as math, mental health, social emotional learning, what? Social emotional learning, um, and increase school choice options to continue uh, to support existing mental health and learning recovery services. Uh, services. Um, the multi system, multi-tiered system of support <coughs> beyond our current one-time expenditures. So um, some of our, our um, services this year are being funded out of one-time money that will end this year. And then to leverage other funding sources to, uh, required of matching funds like for transportation. Um, and then to provide other one-time expenditures. So uh, we collected data from many stakeholders uh, staff members of the district leadership team, uh, parents and staff through the uh, local, co local control accountability plan surveys, high school student groups, and um, Rockland teacher professional organization. The highest priorities of the stakeholder groups are listed here. And as you can see, many priorities overlap, such as safety, learning recovery, and mental health, SEL, and professional development. Dr. McDonald will review uh, some of the spending plan details. Good evening, Board of Trustees. Uh, I am excited to share with you our proposed spending plan for our one-time funds. Um, many of these things will look familiar to you, and uh, because uh, excitedly we have the money to extend some of the things we're doing that are already working. Um, school safety enhancements you heard about already from Mr. Flowers in great detail. That's the $730,000. The second item on that list is learning recovery, which as you know, are our second year of implementation of supporting students who lost learning during the pandemic and how important that is that we, we see that need. We've seen that need in local, state, and national assessments now, and we know that we need to continue doing that. So we're proposing extending uh, learning recovery teachers for uh, two years. We continue to look at that program, make adjustments. Uh, we were learning as we go, but we'd like to continue it because we know it's beneficial to students. Uh, another thing you heard about last month in the special education presentation was about the MTSS team of a program specialist and two instructional coaches that are working to in support teachers in special education and also improve our programs in special education. That will continue, is proposed to continue for two years. Um, and then finally, the board priority of math improvement. You know we're in our second year of math improvement. We're making good progress on PDSAs and tier one instruction, and we wanna make sure that continues uh, for another two years so we can really get at least another two years so we can get a deep implementation and change and improvement in our math program. Um, third bucket you see there is mental health, also an area probably more than any other that we've seen a real need in for students and staff following the pandemic. We, we've seen more social emotional needs, anxiety, depression, extreme behaviors than probably any of us have ever seen in our careers. Uh, we invested this year in four elementary counselors. Um, by all early reports, it's been very successful. Students feel very supported, teachers and staff feel very supported. They're doing that direct counseling, they're doing social skills group, they're working with anxiety groups or grief groups. Um, we wanna expand that program. We're proposing to add two more next year, so for six which would give all elementary schools two and a half days of counseling going forward. So that's a, a exciting proposal. Um, we also wanna continue to, we've expanded and extended mental health at our high schools. So we wanna continue that program going forward because we, we see how important it is every single day. We also wanna do additional pre professional development in this area of mental health for our staff and, um, and make sure that they're prepared to deal with what they're seeing in the classroom. Um, additionally, we wanna do work with parents because we know that parents are struggling at home with some of these same issues with their children. So we wanna make sure we have a robust um, professional development or lecture series for parents. Um, next one is something I'm really excited about. Uh, California has passed several laws uh, to improve services for students diagnosed with dyslexia. Uh, we already have a universal screening program in place for students with dyslexia. 
The next step is how do we serve those students, right, through a, through a structured literacy program. So this money is set aside to build a pilot program at an elementary school that were, would provide that structured literacy program, that research-based curriculum, to help students mitigate their dyslexia and move forward and be successful. As we know, we can't, they can be. And if you don't know, um, the estimate is that 20% uh, of students um, have some degree of dyslexia, so this is an important piece and something I'm excited to do with our school. Um, on the next slide, uh, a board priority is expanding this idea of school choice for parents. Um, we're excited, uh, I know you are, that we, we opened a dual language program this year. And that's off to a good start so far, but we're already looking forward to the next school. Um, and that's gonna be two or three years down the road, but we, um, we like this idea of school of choice, parents like it, so we're looking at an arts integrated school down the road. We'll be starting a committee this fall, and that committee's job is gonna be exploratory. Um, what do good arts integrated schools look like? Are there any local that we can visit? What are model programs that are aligned with um, foundations for art that we can, we can look at? And we'll come back to you with a recommendation, and then this money will be used for funding that and then startup costs to start a new program. Again, hopefully in two to three years, we'll have another school of choice moving forward in Rockford. Um, we spoke uh, extensively and met with our VAPA teachers, and they expressed the need that uh, they have instruments that uh, need replacement and cleaning and repair, so we want to address that. They need clay, they need paints, they need other things to make sure that we have a really robust arts program in Rockland to make sure this continues going forward and it's supported. So you see money set aside there. We heard from students and parents loud and clear that our young athletes in ninth grade uh, value the sports they're able to participate in and we're gonna fund the athletic stipends. We're gonna refund the athletic stipends and move that forward into budget development this year. And finally, um, you know, not only students were impacted by the pandemic, our school staff um, you know, have experienced trauma and anxiety as well. And it also had just affected the cohesiveness of our school. So what we wanna do is we wanna set aside money for each school to build school cultures back, provide money for team building, collaboration, um, whatever it takes to get schools tight again and moving forward together as a unit. It's part of that bigger district vision of collaboration and cooperation. Can I interrupt you on that one? So on the stipends on, on that enhanced collaboration, just one-time money for this year, not moving forward? It's one-time money uh, for next school year, mm -hmm. um, and it would be, uh, an amount would be allotted to each level and each school. What are our plans for funding stipends in the future after uh, that? So for the ninth grade, uh, what the reason why this appears in this year only is we did not budget for the ninth grade stipends this year, so we would, if approved, uh, go back and, and you know repay those back to the schools for the fall year going forward. And then our, we're disclosing that as we come into budget development in the spring, we would build those back into our ongoing budget, which is why the, the item doesn't appear in the out years. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Barbara. Wait, I have a question. Sorry. Um, I don't know if he wants, do you want us to ask him now? Is that fine? That's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, the dyslexia program, is that you, it sounded like it was going to be offered at one school. Can you say a little bit more about that? So what I'd like to do in the spirit of continuous improvement is to um, work with the committee to identify best practices for addressing dyslexia in students and pilot a program at a school where we've experienced dyslexia and have um, staff actually already trained in that area. Um, actually did some work today. It looks like we could maybe do more than one grade level or class and start and then expand that out as we see success in that program. So it would be initially starting small and then growing that program. So my, my initial thought right now, yes, is, is to have one school and as we assess students, if we need to, much like our GATE program, that we could bring students into this program if they needed those, that particular program to be successful. So what would the timeline be for that? So this is the pilot, is that for a year? Is that for six months? H how would that go in the future? In terms of expanding the program mm -hmm. or yeah, how, yeah. how students, so mm -hmm. we have funding, you know, I, I requested funding for two years, kind of for specific positions, but after having some conversations today, I actually think the funding set aside could extend for multiple years because I don't know that I need to buy uh, positions as much as I need to buy curriculum and training for teachers to put this in place. So I actually see this as something that's sustainable 
over multiple years and will just involve really working closely with a group of teachers who are interested in this to um, expand their knowledge in this area. And it, you know, who knows down the road, it could be something where we figure out there's curricular pieces, phonics pieces, structured literacy pieces that all teachers could do. And we could support, you know, we could, we could do this in kindergarten and first grade in a minimal amount of time and be able to meet the needs of the dyslexia population. So do you foresee this as being localized at one school and having kids move to that school if they need the program, or do you foresee this spreading out into all the schools? You're asking a lot of good questions. <laughs> I'm still in the early stages, but what I will say is right now I'm conceiving it as um, if we do, you can accurately screen for dyslexia middle of kindergarten with 95% accuracy. Wow. So. My, my thinking is if we screen in kindergarten, we give a component to kindergarten that everybody can do for 20 minutes a day, but if we screen in kindergarten, we can place students in this program in first grade and bring them into that program and they could have that structured literacy program through elementary school. The, the other piece is we wanna think about this in our multi-tiered systems of support. And so we, um, because there may be, you know, like as uh, Dr. McDonald talked about, you know, that tier one in all classrooms, how do we equip that? So we have least restrictive, and there may be students that have different severity, yep. that maybe we need a tier two right. or tier three. And so a tier three might be at one single right. school, but there, the need is so great that we might offer that there, and then students may, may right. you know, migrate back to their home school when they don't need that. So we, we hope that we would need like a tier three at every school, right. mm -hmm. but, but you can see the build of as like an M our multi-tiered systems of support. So we're really, wanting to use this to kind of figure this out yeah. because we know that needs there and, and that's why we're requesting that. that so I had a question about this. The good news is tier, the, through our MTSS program we currently have with learning recovery, we have teachers in place to do tier three. So it, that, and a lot of them have been trained in Sonde and other dyslexia specific yeah. interventions. So we have that in place, we just need to build it out. So tier one is currently in place, you're saying? Okay. Tier, this is really, uh, how do we address students how do we keep students with dyslexia in tier one and get them what they need to be successful? Yes. Okay. And sorry. No. Oh, sorry. Oh, mine was just really quick. I, I'd love to see a way, if possible, where that tier three could go to the student rather than the student having to leave the home school. So if at all possible, a learning recovery model where it can be an intervention group or however you best see fit. Um, but I'd love to see priority given that we try to get to the student rather than remove them from their home school to participate in this program. Absolutely. So I think you probably answered the question because you said you're early, but the structural literacy, which I'm really particularly excited about, you haven't chosen a curriculum yet for this, correct? Yet. You just know you're going to do some research, research to look at Okay. Because I do wonder, and I really appreciate, Bill, your point of around, Roger, this is tier one, and around thinking of it, because I know I've talked to you, I have this wondering about our balance between phonics uh, and whole language, yep. and, and, and I wonder if we're not as, n not as, uh, not as towards the phonics side as we ought to be. And so I think this gives us a good opportunity to, uh, to see the impact we have with, stu with these students and sort of see if our, our larger curriculum, if we ought to be thinking about our early reading curriculum around that. So that's great, thank exactly. you. Exactly, and, and we're, we're actually nicely aligning. This pilot would nicely align. We're, we're curriculum adoption in ELA is two to three years out. Mm -hmm. So we have some time to kind of, and I agree, I think our current program with the science of reading pieces is we're seeing some deficits in the phonics area. You, you see it, in the, but also the, the science is so clear here that phonics is the way to, it's, it's yep. very, there's no reading wars anymore, it's very clear, so how are we aligning to that? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Bill, thank you very much, and I, I think you can see there's a lot of interest in this, so keep us informed. I yeah. would love to keep hearing about that. Yep. When do they typically reassess after kindergarten? Is it an every year assessment? If you were, if you were found to be dyslexic and in the program you'd be continually assessed, mm -hmm. um, probably weekly. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit, um, I was wondering if you can bring back for the board to consider, I have some concerns about, this is the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary grant, and yet we are spending only 1% of it on arts and music. So. I also know that from our community and our stakeholders, both LCAP surveys to parents, it was second. On students, it was fourth, um, wanting to invest in our music and arts program. And so I know also that you're working on a you know, reimagining elementary music yep. committee in the next few weeks. Would you please um, bring back for us um, maybe an increase in those amounts for us to consider so that we can guarantee success of those programs? 
you know, when we look at over 7 million and music um, and art is given 225,000, I think there's room there for an increase. Thank Absolutely, you. and in the spirit of good news that Matt was sharing, so we know there's mm -hmm. a Proposition 28 right. on the yeah. ballot, and uh, it's unopposed as far as I know, so that also can help us with uh, that funding, but yes, we can bring something back. Thank to you. Mm -hmm. Did Trustee Price, just to, just to clarify Cause I, a little Because I would more. like to say, because I don't know if you were going to say it, but I, I, before we come back and redo this money, let's see if 28 passes and see how we use that money, because I okay. think there's going to be more money dedicated. To, in fact, I was actually going to the opposite, which is we. I want to know in the out years, can we pull back that VAP money if it, now, if it passes, it doesn't mean we're going to get a lot of it. But if we did, and it was awesome, mm -hmm. do we have more? Do we have flexibility now? So I'm 100% so with you. I'm just saying, if we find another funding stream, is there a way to do that? What is the timing? So the, uh, the, the that's why uh, we wanted to bring you a three-year plan. Was it didn't mean we'd spend all the money in this year. We uh, could come back to the board and say there's new information, new funding source, or a new need. So we would recommend the board we alter the plan. So by giving approval, it, it doesn't mean at any time the board could change the plan or that we could recommend changes as well to the board. So it doesn't lock, lock in, even if the Board of State were to approve this whole plan November 16th, it doesn't mean it can't change, um, either by the board request or staff requesting the board to make changes. The uh, other piece is we would know about the outcome, hopefully, of Prop 28 prior to the November 16th uh, approval, we may not know the amount of funding we get. We most likely wouldn't know because the state's not exactly quick in, in doing that. However, um, I, I did want to clarify, uh, President Price, if I could, is your interest to look at increasing this line item or is it to potentially look at funding something that might come out of the elementary music committee for implementation? Or, or something different totally. I just want to make no, sure. No, no, no. It's sure. probably a little bit of a combination of both. I would appreciate, you know, as you meet together at that committee, mm -hmm. seeing what their um, opinion is. I'd love to see that line item be more, you know, 125 a year than versus 75. I think that there's, we haven't spent a whole lot in these programs the last few years. I know that there's some catch up to do with equipment and with also catching up is one thing, but then we've also got to invest to make things better to move things forward. So mm -hmm. I would appreciate seeing something along that. Is that clear enough? Yeah, it is. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And along with that, I, I do think slide 11 shows us we have about half a million dollars of remaining funds unallocated. And so that right. could be of assistance there of portioning a little bit out because I'd be interested in hearing what that committee finds as well. Thank you. So the first line here is um, to use these funds as our matching for the uh, two previously presented items tonight for our uh, electric bus grants. As you saw, it's kind of leveraging 10 to 1 ratio of our funding versus uh, grant funding. Um, we also have 10 white vans in the district that are used for uh, student transportation and educational and uh, extracurricular activities. And they're all 20 years old or older. And so this is proposing that we um, start replacing them. And so this would replace uh, four vans, two per year. Uh, technology replacement and upgrades needs of 400,000 this year and an additional 100,000 in each of the two out years. The board has already committed $500,000 of fund balance uh, in the two out years, or I'm sorry, three out years starting in 23-24 uh, to partially backfill the um, equipment replacement program budget that was reduced through budget reductions in prior years. Uh, it was 800 and this year it's 100,000. That's why we're doing 400,000 this year um, to try to guess back up to that level. And then, um, uh, one-time funding for critical facilities needs. Parker Whitney fire alarm really needs to be replaced. And um, the district has 695 uh, HVAC units beyond their life expectancy district-wide. Uh, this would not replace all of them, but it would be a start. Um, and then because we are starting early this year to develop this expenditure plan in order to give staff time to implement um, for the best possible outcomes. As, um, as uh, Board Member Satoff mentioned, we have approximately $550,000 that have not been um, allocated in this plan, um, and so it leaves the board with flexibility. 
Again, the district has until June of 26 to spend the arts, music, instruction, material discretionary block grant funds and 2028 to spend the learning recovery emergency block grant funds. So since this is a three-year spending plan, um, as staff gather and analyze data on the results of implementing the plan, adjustments can be made or other one-time needs may um, arise. Um, also would note that um, the district has already spent a little over 3.6 million of the art, music, um, instructional materials, discretionary block grant um, for one-time uh, funding payments to employees per negotiated settlement agreement with labor uh, groups um, that were negotiated last June. So next steps is to update the uh, um, proposed plan based on board input and present to the board on the November 16th meeting uh, the plan for approval and then begin implementing the actions and continue to report back to the board um, with updates on implementation as actions completed. Thank you so much, Barbara. Are there any additional comments or questions? Um, I did have one thing, just kind of a overall, and I hate to go back to this, but on the enhanced collaboration, can you explain again kind of what does that mean as far as helping the mm -hmm. community of schools and how much of that money is going to really help? Uh, one. Um, yeah. is, in s the, the, yeah, so that's a great question. And is, is Dr. McDonald um, kind of shared one of the big interests is that we know that we uh, want to work to deepen the connections, collaborations of our staffs at school. And, and if you take even like, see, Rockland High School is a great example. You have a large number of staff that help really open and found that school. And then you have a lot of staff that are newer. So how, how this one option that the school could choose to use is how do we come together and take a look at updating that vision, the buy-in? So really what our, how we see this money being done is we would set aside a certain amount for like a high school, middle school, elementary, uh, allocate this to the schools with some guidelines and ask the schools to come up with a plan of how they'd like to spend the dollars. And we would give them under this three years to spend those dollars. So they would come together, figure out their needs with, within some guidelines, submit that plan, and then they could look at what their needs are because Rockland High School staff may have different needs than say Sierra Elementary. So, so we see this being used as for a combination of the collaboration, that, that culture building within the staff, the team building, those pieces to really support what, what we know really makes a good school environment to work in. And as we've heard the theme of collaboration as well. Yeah, and I feel like just what I kind of wanted to harp on is that, at least from my perspective, it seems that enhancing collaboration here is kind of one of, of a priorities that should be looked at, especially since we're coming out of a very highly disconnected couple of years. Mm -hmm. And um, I just am wondering if there's any possibility for more to be put into this segment of the spending. Um, that's just, I wanted to say that, but that's my opinion. Um, we, we, and this is uh, absolutely was the, the, oh, to get input. Yeah, so please go. Yeah, so this, I mean, we, this is brought to the board as we went through all the stakeholder inputs you saw. Uh, ironically, the board is the kind of the last group to get, to give the input, but we wanted you to see the input of everyone else. So this is really our opportunity, your opportunity to share that and then ask for revision. So what I would, um, you know, uh, maybe what we can do is bring back a little bit more detail as well as the amounts per school that they would be, be having to spend and then that can be a conversation point as well for the board of should that be increased, should that not? I'd say to you, this is an idea that's been tried across the state. Uh, several different schools, they've done this really, really well in San Jose, for example, and it's actually had great long-term uh, positive impact and they have actually great relations. And so part of this to me is a, is, is a pilot, which I think is the right way to spend dollars, which is let's try it, let's see how it goes, let's see, and then if it is successful, as we hope it will be, then we can expand it from there. And do it. so I think this is a good down payment on testing to see if it works. But Eddie, I also wanna say thank you for noting that and seeing and understanding how important that is for schools to be a collective community and to have that collaboration 
to be welcoming and everything we want them to be for the students. I think if the school itself and the staff collaborate well and create that community, it just makes it all that much better for students. Yeah, I, I, I just feel like if there's something to fix now, it would be that especially because of the history that we've had in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. Oh, Eddie, oh, if that's okay. I, I just want to say I appreciate that because as you think of tangible things as a student that could work, let us know because one of the things I like about this model is I know the last two years we really asked for the opportunity to have information items brought before the board so we can kind of talk and understand and throw out ideas we're hearing and then have the item come back as an action item. You know, in the past it was really hard if we're seeing something the first time and having to vote that night, we're not getting this dialogue. And so I just wanted to open that up to you, Eddie. That's, I think, really the intent of the information item tonight is to hear from the board, including you, hey, what, what areas are we maybe missing or what do we want to refine before we bring something back to the board and the community to vote on? So this is the perfect time to make requests and say, hey, I think we need to have puppies on campus during finals week. I don't know, whatever it may be. Um, but thank you, Eddie, for bringing that up. So if you have specifics, Feel free, throw them out right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara and Dr. McDonald. Appreciate your time. We'll now open agenda item 11.1, .1, public comment on non-agenda items. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Board of Education in open meeting. Members of the public are encouraged to address the board concerning any item on the agenda or any item of interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. The board will not take action or have discussion on any item not appearing on the posted agenda except as authorized by law. We note that the views and comments expressed during public comment are those of the individual speaker and do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, or positions of the district, board, or district staff. The district believes in an inclusive, welcoming, and safe environment for its meetings for all of our community. The board respects each individual's rights to express ideas and opinions. However, we expect speakers to refrain from personal attacks based on protected categories under state and federal law, including race, religion, disability, sexual orientation. It is an ongoing objective of the district to serve all of our students and prepare them to flourish as responsible, ethical, and productive citizens. In preserving this mission, we kindly ask that when making public comment, you refrain from the use of profanity, exercise tolerance of others and their viewpoints, and exemplify model behavior. Please be mindful that district students are watching. You are encouraged to address the board and the public in a respectful manner, such, as th such that all observing from children to adults are made to feel welcome, safe, and valued. The board will not permit any disturbance or willful interpretation of board meetings. Persistent or excessive disruption by any individual or group shall be grounds for the board president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board. Under recently adopted law, disruptive individuals may be removed or excluded from the board meeting. We appreciate the public's participation and your assistance in helping the board keep its meetings efficient, effective, and respectful. We have one public comment tonight from Diana. Would you please um, mention your name again, um, the school that your children attend, and you have three minutes. Good evening, everyone can hear me okay? Uh, my name is Diana Watkins, and I have a student at Whitney and one at Springview. I wanted to come tonight and share an idea of how we can better support students after an absence. Currently, when our middle and high school students are absent from school, they are told to check Schoology for any missed assignments. Students are left to essentially teach themselves the missed classroom instruction and complete the missed assignments on their own. This may work for some students, but it doesn't work for many of them. For students with a heavier academic schedule, students in classes that are particularly challenging for them, or students that struggle with academic organization, being out of school for more than a day or two can be devastating. My oldest attended high school in another district, Placer Union High School District, for his senior year last year. They came up with what I think is a pretty cool way to provide supports to students following an absence. The district, the district used some of their COVID funding to hire teachers whose sole job is to provide support to students who have been out of the classroom. After Austin had been absent for a couple of days, not due to COVID, just an everyday cold, I received a phone call from one of these teachers asking me if it was okay if she followed up with him to see if he needed any support in getting caught up with his missed assignments. If needed, she would also coordinate with his teachers to make sure that everyone was on the same page to ensure that he didn't fall behind. I thought this was a really great resource. With a lighter senior schedule, he didn't really need much help in getting caught up. 
However, I know plenty of kids who would benefit greatly from this type of intervention and support. I'm thinking of my middle kiddo who can struggle with academic organization. Being absent for any amount of time is likely to lead to a cascade of missed assignments, putting him in a hole from which it can be really difficult to climb out. I think we would all agree that the ideal place for a student to learn is the classroom. The reality is, is that kids are going to get sick and occasionally miss school or be out of the classroom for any number of other, of other life reasons. Our middle and high school teachers are each responsible for hundreds of students and it can be really difficult for them to stay on top of each and every student's individual particular needs. It would be great if we could provide additional resources to these student teachers and implement a similar program here in Rockland to ensure that our students have the support they need to get caught up and not fall further behind in their coursework. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Diana. Appreciate solutions being shared. Thank you. Trustees, uh, item number 12.2, 12.1, I apologize, pending agenda items. Do you have any items to be placed on the pending agenda? Okay, seeing none, the meeting is now adjourned to a closed session.